Good evening. I'm glad for another opportunity for us to take a look at God's word. And so tonight's lesson is going to be continuing our series on Galatians chapter five, the fruit of the spirit. And we looked last month at the idea of this word showing that faith is a fruit of the spirit. And so when we trust and obey God's word, faith is seen in our lives. We looked at that idea last time, how that Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, verse 16, you will know them by their fruit. And we looked at how the scriptures teach that our faith is shown through our works. And so the King James Version uses faith in this first and the New King James Version and other versions use faithfulness. So I just thought it might be good to do a two part series regarding this section. And last week we showed how that faith can be seen just like the other fruit of the spirit. And we're going to look tonight at some examples of faithfulness. And so just as love can be seen in your life and also if you lack love in your life, that also can be seen. Joy in your life can be seen. Likewise, if you lack joy in your life, that too can be seen. Faithfulness can be seen in your lives. And likewise, if you lack faith, um, it'll show that you lack faithfulness. And so a lifestyle of faith will lead to a lifestyle of faithfulness. If we see someone not living faithfully, it shows that that's an indicator that they're lacking faith in their lives. And Romans chapter 10, verse 17 tells us faith comes by hearing the word of God, or some translations say the preaching of Christ. And so in James chapter 2, verse uh, 22, or I'm sorry, James 1, 22, it tells us not to be hearers of the word only, but also to be doers of the word. And so if we want faith in our lives, not only do we have to hear the word of God, but also we have to do it. If we want biblical faith, that's what we need to do. We need to study and we need to apply it. And In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, a lot of these verses, a lot of us are probably familiar with, and that's good. It shows that you've been listening to the New Testament, you've been studying, and hopefully this will be a reminder for us as we hear these things to apply them to our lives. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 tells us that it's required that we be found faithful. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And you know, even the world acknowledges the principle that's taught in this verse, An employee is not going to or an employer is not going to hire an unfaithful worker. They're going to look for that faithful worker. And if an unfaithful worker is in their company, they're going to look to cut them off to reduce their hours. They don't want them there. They want to replace them with someone who is going to do what they are instructing. And likewise, God has hired us to be workers in his kingdom. And so we need to be faithful in studying the scriptures and applying them to our lives and for teaching these scriptures to other people. And so there was a reward for the faithful, but notice that the reward is only for the faithful. As it stated, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And so in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, I, uh, you see the dot, 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 because there's more words before this. But the idea presented, which I captured here, is found all throughout the scripture. How that if you want to receive eternal life, you have to live in faith and you have to die in faith. Hebrews chapter 11 has lots of examples of individuals who lived in faith and died in faith. They have not yet received the promise of eternal life, but we will together receive that promise, that crown of life at the coming of Christ. And so all those individuals in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that they are a cloud of witnesses for people who live by faith And they are still in expectation of the promise of eternal life, just like us. We're waiting for that crown of life, which here is just mentioned. uh, It's a reference for eternal life. And so the ultimate reward for living in faith and dying in faith is going to be that crown of life. And so in Matthew chapter 25, we have here this parable. And this parable is about the event of the judgment day when Christ comes and we all have to stand before him um, to give an account of ourselves. If you, and this is a fun fact because I've been studying the Olivet Discourse and leading into Matthew chapter 25, which this is a part of the Olivet Discourse. But when Jesus gives the parables about his coming, the first few parables are about the surprise event to those living on the earth. Um, some people are, well, it's going to be a surprise to everyone because when Christ comes, It's going to be a moment of surprise. Nobody is expecting it. And so there's 250 babies born every minute. And so that's what at least three to four babies born a second. So at the same second that three or four babies are going to be 
uh, born, the world is going to be destroyed. And so it's a surprise factor. The first few parables regarding um, the coming of Christ in this parable in the Olivet Discourse concerning the coming of Christ. It concerns the account that we have to give when he comes. And in this case, this there's two faithful servants, one unfaithful servant. So we're looking at this faithful servant who was faithful over a few things, who was able to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And so some will be saved on that day when Christ comes and some will be lost. And so we learn from this parable here that it's the faithful who are going to enter into the joy of their Lord, which is just like when it mentions the crown of life. It's symbolic for uh, it's referencing eternal life that the faithful individual will receive. And so it says they were faithful over a few things. And so this person didn't have much responsibility, but the responsibility that they were given, they were faithful in those areas. And so tonight, hopefully we'll examine a few things in our own lives of where we can be found faithful, such as being a father, um, a mother, a wife, a husband. And we're going to look at some of those ideas, but hopefully we'll be able to see some of those few things where we can be rewarded in our own lives. This isn't a long list. It doesn't cover every single topic, every area where we have responsibilities, but it does cover the few things in which we are expected if we have these positions and roles to be found faithful. And so hopefully we're going to cover some of these things tonight. And so you might uh, bear with me because I'm new to being a husband. I'm new to being a father. I don't know what it's like to be a wife and a mother or a daughter, but I know what it's like to be a son. And so as I explain these things, uh, it's based on what the scriptures teach. And so the scriptures teach, though, that we can show our faithfulness to God being a husband, being a father, being a wife, being a mother, being a son, being a daughter. You can show faithfulness to God in your workplace as an employer and as an employee. And also, especially to show faithfulness to God as a citizen in the community. Um, obeying, we're going to look at obeying the governing authorities in the community, but also we have a duty in the community to show our faithfulness to God by teaching the lost and evangelizing. And so, um, these roles at times can be challenging, but God has given us instructions how to fulfill these roles. And it's not just that God has given us instructions and says, here's what you need to do and you're on your own and I'm just going to sit back and you need to do what you're going to do. In Hebrews chapter 13, it tells us that the blood of the everlasting covenant is able to help establish us in every good work. And so there's power as we try to follow these teachings, as we listen to these instructions and we want to apply them, as we believe in God and his son, Jesus Christ, there's actual power that helps us keep these commandments. And so the first one is regarding marriage. Um, when a person gets married, as stated from this scripture, their new top priority is no longer being a son or being a daughter, but their new top priority is being a husband or being a wife. And he answered and said to them, these are Jesus's words. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And so as much as I love and respect my parents and especially with fear, um, the Bible teaches that once I got married, I took on a new role. And now I am first a husband before I am a son. And that doesn't mean I can disrespect my parents. It doesn't mean I have. Um, what it means is that I have the duty of honoring my wife before anyone else. And God expects the husband to be faithful to his wife. God expects the wife to be faithful to her husband. And if both spouses are being faithful to God, the result is that they're going to be faithful to one another. And so um, the parents we're going to learn have the duty and obligation to prepare the individuals who enter into marriage for that time in their life if they decide to get married. But marriage is a lifelong commitment where your spouse comes first before anyone else. And I know marriage is until death. So me and Aurora talk about this and it's, uh, it's hard topics that you have to talk about because, for example, as much as we don't want to see it happen, life is so uncertain. If Josiah died, me and Aurora would still have the responsibility to serve God together. If I died, Aurora and Josiah would still have the responsibility to commit themselves to God and remain faithful. Same thing. 
if me and Josiah died, she would still have that responsibility to serve God. And so um, we talked about that multiple times. And so it's conversations which we need to have with our family, especially if we're especially if we're married. Marriage severs the or death severs the marriage bond. And so we need to help prepare each other for receiving eternal life. And that starts now when we're married. And marriage, whether we're single, married, divorced, or widowed, uh, we have a duty to teach these teachings to our community. And so by being faithful to your spouse, you're showing your faithfulness to God. The book of Solomon, it shows this beautiful picture of devotion between two individuals, a man and a woman. And it, it teaches the concept of faithfulness, how that the husband and the wife, they find intense pleasure within each other. They're not looking outside of that relationship between two people to fulfill their desires. And so I have, I'm going to review this diagram, but here's the verse. Um, you are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. This is the idea. Your spouse is where you find your desire. This is the idea. You know, you're perfect. I wouldn't change anything about you. And so by being faithful to your spouse, you're showing your faithfulness to God. And here's an example of what you don't want to do. This is an example of um, eyes of adultery. If you and your spouse are together and, you know, you're looking at someone else, even if you're not with your spouse, but you're married and you're looking at someone else, you can't do that. Likewise, if you're with your spouse and you're holding hands with them and thinking, oh, I'm holding hands with Jane Doe, you know, and so you're imagining your spouse as someone else. You're not allowed to do that. And so likewise, you know, here's John Doe and here's uh, the woman with eyes of adultery for a man. And just looking at him, that's not what this verse is teaching. This verse teaches if you have eyes that you have a desire, you need to look at your spouse. And so you can't think of your spouse as someone else. That's your spouse. That's who that is. That's who that soul is. And so we're going to get into this idea of marriage, how that as a husband, your duty is toward your wife. You don't have an obligation to another person's wife. Or another woman, we have the obligation to share the gospel, but concerning uh, the desires that a marriage relationship has as a spouse, your duty is toward your wife and God will hold us accountable for how we treat our spouse. And so here's some examples about how a husband can show his faithfulness to God by loving his wife. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Ephesians chapter five, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And these verses, they characterize the attitude in which a husband should have toward his wife if he wants to be counted faithful. All of these points, which I'm going to review as we backtrack and go over these verses, this should be taught to our children when they're growing up. These things need to be taught to a man before he enters into that marriage commitment. Um, Marriage is serious and it's lifelong and we need to understand the serious of that commitment because God is going to hold accountable the husband who mistreats his wife. Number one, we should dwell with them. Husbands should dwell with their, li their wives, spending time with them, giving them attention and focus, understanding how God, it is, God says that we should dwell with them. And so when it says that the wife is the weaker vessel, this just indicates that they have a different set of emotions than we do. And so we need to be understanding how their emotions are being displayed toward us um, when they reveal something to us that matters to them. And, you know, it's men. Uh, I know Aurora talks to me about stuff and it's more, you know, on the emotional basis where you have to learn to care. You know, you can't just have what the world says, that man attitude and say, oh, well, get over it. No, that's not what God tells us to do. God tells us to honor them as the weaker vessel. We need to understand that we are heirs together of the grace of life. This means that we're going to heaven together. And so when we die... Death severs that marriage bond. And so we need to understand that before we die, we have the goal of trying to en encourage one another to live in faith. So that way we might die in faith and receive that crown of life. We should give honor to the wife. And so if you honor someone, you're not going to speak evil about them. You're not going to speak 
evil toward them, but you're going to recognize them in a position of respect. This is just like in Romans chapter 13 regarding the government. And it says, give honor to whom honor is due. And so this is the idea. You need to give this divine respect to your wife, understanding that um, she is deserving of honor. And these aren't just recommendations. These are commandments given by God. And if we violate these commandments, God is going to hold us accountable on the day that we have to give an account for ourselves. And praying together. This is one thing also that a husband should be making sure that he is doing with his wife. The standard in Ephesians chapter five by which a husband should love his wife is the greatest standard of all the love which Christ had for the church. And so in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it tells us that Jesus purchased the church with his blood. Here it says he gave himself for her. This is the idea of dying for her. But then when Jesus died, he ascended into heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit to reveal godly and holy instructions that the members of the church might be um, holy and without blemish. So this is what we should be doing with our wives. We should love our lives, our wives enough not only to lay down our lives for her. That's easy to say about anyone. I'd lay my life down for you. OK, well, while they have their life, how are you spending your time with them here? We need to encourage our wives with the instructions of the word that they might receive the nourishment that they need as wives. And if we do that, if we help encourage our wives as husbands regarding the duties which we both have in the marriage relationship, that's going to prepare for a happy marriage. And also that's going to be preparing for raising faithful children when that time comes. And so just for what this verse means, when it says that Jesus gave himself for the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That's the instructions that we receive to be water baptized according to the instructions of the word. When we're water baptized according to the word, we are cleansed because the blood of Christ cleanses us. But I wanted to show this, that the instructions are what commands us what to do in order to be cleansed. So we should desire as husbands holiness for our wives and godliness. And as a father, your duty is toward your children. The ultimate goal a father should have for his children is that they grow up learning the teachings of the new covenant. Children make many mistakes. And so it's not the role of the father to over discipline their children, to over correct them. But the role of the father is to instruct the children in the teachings of the new covenant. In Ephesians chapter six, verse four, it says, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Third John chapter one, verse four says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And so in third John chapter one, verse four, John isn't writing his biological children here. This is reference to individuals who he played a part in their conversion process. And so the principle is still the same, though, that a parent has no greater joy than to hear that their children are walking according to the truth, especially when their children no longer live with them. So John wrote this letter to these Christians. That tells us something that tells us that he wasn't just within walking distance to them. He was far enough away that a letter had to be sent. And so what we can learn from this example, John had a part in their conversion. And now he's writing to them is that the role of a parent in this case, a father, um, the role of a father is to teach the children the truth. That way, when they move far enough away that you have to send a letter to talk to them, that they are established in the truth enough that when they leave that far from home, you can still receive a letter hearing that they're walking in truth. And so that's the goal. That's why we have so much time with our children uh, to teach them the new covenant doctrine and to make sure that they're prepared for when they leave and uh, that they might be established and walk in the truth. And so the father's duty is to make sure the children know what the will of the Lord is. But it's the children's decision whether or not they're going to follow those instructions as a wife. Your duty is toward your husband. And so we're going to look at some examples of how a wife can be faithful to her husband. Basically, this section, which we're going to read, is summarizing the type of a wife which a person can look at and say, wow, you know what? You're a good wife. And first Peter chapter three, verse one through six. And we're going to learn what this is presenting is the idea that 
a woman should not be known in the community for her apparel, for how she looks, for how extravagant her outward appearance is, but she should be known for her loyalty to her husband. And so it says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct, meaning innocent conduct, accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Now, husbands, we don't know what it's like to be put in this role, this position of being a wife, but we have the same instructions written here for us that we can help them fulfill this duty and we can learn together the word of Christ. And um, when it tells the wives to be submissive to their husbands, the idea being presented is that the wife should know that the husband is the head of the wife. He is the authority in the marriage. And this is not just Christian marriage. This is the marriage rules for even non-Christians. And so all men today are under the law of Christ. And so God will hold all individuals in marriage um, accountable who violate the teachings of the New Testament. And so just like a man, a woman um, needs to be prepared before entering into a marriage relationship that these are the things which are expected of you. If a Christian has a non-Christian husband that's involved in sinful conduct, look at this. That's what this says. Um, we're not saying they're involved in sinful conduct, but that's the idea. These are non-Christian husbands. They're not cleansed. They're not saved. It says, wives, be submissive to your husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your innocent conduct. So just because one spouse is involved in sin doesn't mean that the other spouse has to likewise partake of that. If uh, your spouse is partaking in sin, you still have a duty, though you're married to them, to remain innocent in, in the fear of God. And um, let's see, we, we already covered this, how that a woman shouldn't be known in the community for the arranging of hair, the wearing of gold or the putting on a fine apparel. She shouldn't be known for how she looks outwardly, but she should be known for the hidden person of her heart. And she is a, has a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And it says that women have Old Testament examples also of who they can practice and pattern themselves after to be faithful to their husbands. And it says Sarah was one of those individuals who women should look at and say, Sarah was a good wife. I want to be like her. Sarah obeyed Abraham. And as she was obeying Abraham, it says she was doing good. And so that's the pattern which wives have today is that not only do they obey their husbands and are submissive to them, but also they are doing good deeds. And so this isn't to say that a woman needs to be married in order to please God. But these are the things which God expects if a woman desires to enter into a, a marriage bond. And so as a mother, mothers have the duty toward your children. And so just how the ultimate goal of a father is to train the children to be raised in the new covenant doctrines and teachings. This should be the mother's uh, goal also. The mother's influence can help determine the faithfulness of future generations. And we're going to look at, although being a mother is stressful. I mean, being a father sometimes is stressful. I know I have a lot of help. A lot of people have it a lot more stressful than me. But here's the thing that even though having children is stressful, um, God still expects both parents to be faithful, to have the characteristic of love and holiness and self-control. In this case, it mentions the woman. Um, but we're, we'll look at that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. It says, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, uh, Eunice, and I am persuaded is also in you. So it started with the grandmother, um, Lewis who was faithful to God. And she taught her child, Eunice, to be faithful to God. And Eunice taught Timothy to be faithful to God. So the role of a mother 
is important in helping raise up these future generations that are going to come to pass. When a woman makes the decision to become a mother, um, this is what she needs to be aware of, that even though children are stressful, um, there's going to be a lot of energy and attention needed to be given to that child, but that's no excuse to stop pursuing love and faith and holiness and self-control. And so the mothers have a great responsibility in being an example toward the children. As a child, you know, so no children in here are going to get out of this one either. If we're talking about what husbands and wives and um, mothers and fathers have to do, there's a duty for children also. And as a, a child, your duty is toward your parents. And so oftentimes we might hear this, um, so-and-so's parents let them do this. And so you might not want to hear this, but in a sense, who cares? Those aren't your parents. You know, your duty is toward your parents. When I say who cares, I mean, we do care. We care about your feelings, but it's like someone saying, you know, oh, I'm good at playing instruments, you know? Okay, who cares? Like, you want to bring them into the church? Like, that doesn't, just because you're good at instruments, like, who cares in that sense? Um, it has nothing to do being relative to the topic under discussion, which we're trying to present um, the idea that, oh, so-and-so's parents let them do it. They're not your parents. Your parents are trying to do what's best for you. If they say yes, that means yes. If they say no, that means no. You do what your parents tell you, but I found an exception. If your parents are not Christians, you don't have to keep their religion. And so in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, he writes to these Christians and says that you were not redeemed through the corruptible traditions, the corruptible things like silver and gold, the traditions of your fathers, but you were redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, it also tells us uh, whoever loves father or mother more than me, Jesus says, is not worthy of following me. So if your parents are not Christians, you don't have the obligation to, if they say, you know what, you can't go assemble with uh, the Church of Christ today that meets on Pine Street. You're going to have to come to um, the Muslim mosque. You don't have that obligation to do that. Um, we have obligation to serve God first and put him above. But just because even if that was the case and your parents were a different religion, that doesn't mean that you are therefore not obligated to serve them at all. You still have to respect them and honor them. If they need help, you still need to help them. But the idea is, is you don't have to believe what they believe. Otherwise, you're going to be condemned also along with them. In Hebrews chapter 12, we come across this teaching that parents are just trying to do the best that they can. They're trying to instruct their children. And so, you know, my parents always told me, just wait till you're older and you have children. And now, I mean, I'm finally getting it. You know, all those teachings and instructions over those years that didn't make sense are now starting to make a whole lot of sense. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, meaning they punished us and corrected us. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so when your parents punish you, you get in trouble, you get grounded. That sure does not feel good. But you know why that's happening is so that we can learn the right thing to do. And sometimes as parents, we do mess up and we discipline for the wrong things or we over discipline. But you know what? We're trying our best and the children need to understand that your parents are just trying to do what's best for you to make you understand. And if you listen to them this time, guess what? You might not get in trouble next time. In Ephesians chapter six, verse one through three, a lot of people might not know this, but children are commanded in the New Testament to obey their children or obey their parents. And notice what it says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. If your parents are Christians, you are lucky. You are so blessed. They're raising you up in the truth. And you as children of Christian parents, you need to obey your parents. And it says this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. We're going over the book of Proverbs and a lot of the instructions say, you know, if you don't practice the truth, you're going to die. Those things lead to death. The end of those things thereof is death. And so the reason why parents are instructing their children is because death could happen to any one of us at any moment. And children need to be aware that they're not the wisest and the parents are, we're just trying to do our best. I can say that now we are trying to do our best. 
And so children need to obey your parents. As an employer, your duty is toward your employee. And so basically, the employer has the duty to pay their employee what is um, required. The laborer is worthy of his wages, as we're going to read. You know, there's some types of employers in the world who don't pay their employees. Either, you know, they fire them and they don't pay them their last paycheck, or they promise to pay them and they never pay them, or... Uh, they pay them, but they pay them less than was negotiated. And so they might be able to get away with that now, these employers, but one day will come when everyone will have to give an account to Christ. And because these individuals um, were unfaithful employers, the face of the Lord is set against them. And so these are examples of individuals who might not hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because they are keeping back wages which individuals are deserving of. Indeed, this is James chapter 5, verse 4. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached unto the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. So just as we read, you know, I think it was uh, Cain killed Abel and Abel's blood was crying out. So the idea is, is that these individuals are being defrauded and they're crying out to God for justice. And God is not unaware of those situations. God knows when an employer is being unfaithful. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, this is reference to it's, uh, the elder who is worthy of double honor because he labors in the word also. But the principle is still the same. The scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And so as an employer, you can show your faithfulness to God by giving to your employees what they deserve. Colossians 4, 1, masters. This is in the case of slaves and slave owners, but we can learn from this the principle that you need to give to them what is right. Give to your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And Colossians and Ephesians, the ends of these chapters are pretty much parallel. So it's written there also, you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. God has no respect of persons. He has no favorites. If any individual does something wrong, they're going to have to give an account for that wrong that they do. And so employers might be able to get away with it now, but not on the day when all individuals uh, have to give an account. And same thing as an employee. God expects us to be faithful as employees. As an employee, your duty is toward your employer. If we want to show our faithfulness to God in the workplace, we need to do what's expected of us um, with an attitude that glorifies God. The scripture says, do all things without murmurings, disputings, and complaining. And so, there's basically, you know, three categories of workers. There's those who don't do anything even when the boss is around. There's those who work only when the boss is around. And then there's what we're striving to be, those individuals who work hard when the boss is around and when the boss is around. Because ultimately, our, our boss is always around. And our boss is the Lord Jesus Christ who sees all things. And it tells us knowing that um, we should serve him. Because he's going to receive, give us the reward of the inheritance. Our temporary employer might be able to give us a pay stub that says, you know, uh, $1,000 a month or every two weeks. But ultimately, Jesus will give us, it's figurative, I'm talking here, a paycheck that says eternal life. And so that's who we're working for is the Lord. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Here, this is reference to slaves, but the idea, the principle is still the same. The employer employee relationship. Obey in all things, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. And so here, the we can say in this case, the employee is told there's no partiality. And if we go back to the employer, there's no partiality. So the employer and the employee are both expected to be faithful to God because we all have to give an account. And if we slack off at our job now, we might be able to get away with it now, but not on that day. And if we slack off now and as employees and don't do what's expected of us, that day might not be so good for us. And so let's make those changes today. 
as a citizen, uh, your duty is toward your community. And so in two areas, which I sp chose, there's a lot of other areas in which we can serve the community. But these are the two main areas in which we should obey the government. You know, if a cop pulls you over, you need to understand that he bears the sword, meaning he can punish us. And he actually has authority if they feel the need to do so. The threat that they can take our life away from us. And today in America, the penalties aren't so harsh, you know, but you look at the Roman government, who was it that was crucified next to Jesus? What was his crime? A thief. He just simply stole and he was crucified and had his life taken from him. And so we need to understand, I like this saying because parents need to discipline their children because if you don't spank them now, they're just going to get body slammed by the police later or shot by the police later. And so we need to teach our children to obey the government because this is what God wants us to do. If we want to be faithful in the community, um, then it starts here. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves, saying, if you're doing wrong and the authorities find out, you better be afraid because they're coming to get you. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have the praise of the saints. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers can, uh, attending continually to this very thing. And so it tells us, render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so this is the same which I mentioned earlier, that husbands are to give honor to the wife. And so um, we have duties to remain faithful to God toward in our family relationship and also toward the government. And, you know, there's a lot of individuals and this is popular. I'm sure a lot of us understand it and hopefully we should condemn it and not be OK with it. There's, you know, sayings going around where individuals are saying toward the president, let's go, Brandon. And there's something that happened where they were saying curse wor words towards Joe Biden as the president. But, you know, what? he's the president. We should pray for him. It says fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. We should not speak evil of those who are in the government, government um, who are authorities above us. We should pray for them. We should seek for their salvation, even if we disagree with them. You know, when this was written, this was written during the time when Christians are being persecuted uh, by the Roman government, dragged off the prison. James was beheaded. And so even during that time period, they're told to pay taxes, to give honor to whom's honor and to fear the government because they have the sword of God to take your life from you. And so ultimately, our faithfulness, being in the community, should be teaching the lost. Um, if we want to show faithfulness to God in the community, we should be trying our best to teach those we come across about Jesus who died for us and the need to be baptized and have our sins forgiven through his blood. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So there's the idea. You're making disciples of all nations. You have your Bible study with someone. Then they're baptized. And then guess what? Then after they're baptized, you're continuing to teach them to observe all things. And so us here who have been baptized, we're past that. Now what are we doing? Now we're trying to be, uh, we're trying to learn all things that Jesus has commanded. And now that we've been baptized, we have this duty and obligation to go and make disciples of all nations. There's just a, a circle, a repeating process. Mark 16, 15, 16, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And so if we want to show faithfulness to God in our community, these are the things which bring glory to God as we share with others. Even if others reject the truth, this is still a, a pleasing aroma to God. And the aroma, it smells good. You know, you smell a, a barbecue, that smells good. When you preach the gospel to an individual, telling them Jesus died for their sins, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Even if they reject it, you know what, to God, that smells good. That's a sweet aroma. And so hopefully this wasn't a long list or extensive by uh, any means. There's a lot more that could be said about this. I'm sure a lot of us are really familiar with all these things. But um, let's look at how faithful are we? Let's look at some areas in which um, we can grow in faithfulness to God in our marriage as a husband, as a father, in our marriage as a wife and a mother, in uh, our family as a son and a daughter. 
Let's grow in faithfulness at our workplace as an employer and as an employee. And let's grow as faithfulness, grow in faithfulness as citizens in the community as we try our best to teach the lost about the gospel of Christ. If you have any need and uh, prayer, request prayer from the congregation, we'd love to pray with you. And if anyone has the need to be baptized and be forgiven for their sins, we can help uh, accomplish that tonight also. You can come to the front as we stand and sing.